Oh, there the we system. Go. Should I start again or continue? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, so A cells being continued to the A cells, they do not behave exactly in the same way, as I mentioned, but these are the cell types involved in the different forms of opacification within the capsular bag that you can see postoperatively, such as anterior capsule opacification, posterior capsule opacification, and if you have two optics inside of the capsular bag, you can have interlenticular opacification in the space between the lenses. So now this is not moving. Oh, good. So um, in 2007, I wrote a review paper describing different causes of intraocular lens opacification and discoloration. And a lot of what I'm going to present today is related to that, but of course there are many updates to it. And what I would like to do is go over these problems by classes of materials. So let us go ahead and start with the hydrophilic acrylic lenses or hydrogel lenses. We are going to comment about calcification and we are going to comment about interaction with capsular dyes. So calcification, it's been a big problem. We have been investigating this since many years with many publications about the subject. And many years ago, there were some relatively large scale problems of calcification involving these three lenses. Hydroview by Bausch & Lomb, the SC60BOV by Medical Developmental Research, and the AquaSense by Ophthalmic Innovation Internationals. So many, many lenses were explanted because of it. And with the Hydroview by Bausch & Lomb, what we were observing was like a crust of calcified deposits on the surface and subsurface of the optic of the lens. As you can see here, this is a histological section of the lens and is stained with the Foncosa method for calcium. You can also use another histochemical method to demonstrate calcium, which is the elysium red. Here we stain directly the surface of the intraocular lens. But we always like to confirm this by performing scanning electron microscopy associated with some form of surface analysis for elemental composition. That's what you are seeing here, energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy. So this is done in each deposit and you can get the elemental composition such as calcium and phosphorus, which is usually the composition in this complication. But with the SC60BOV lens, things were very different. Actually, the calcification was observed within the substance of the lens, as you can see here, and also in the section of the lens, and here with the elysium red. And here, basically, you can see the surface of the lens. So it's like the patient had a cataract, a, a nucle nuclear cataract again. And here you can see the confirmation with calcium and phosphorus as components of the calcified deposits. With the AquaSense, the degree of uh, opacification was totally amazing. There are calcified deposits on the surface, subsurface, within the substance of the lenses. And uh, again, the degree of opacification was quite impressive. And here you have the confirmation that the deposits contain calcium and phosphorus. So then later, there was a large scale problem with this lens named Memory Lens by a company named Siva Vision. Many of these lenses were explanted because of that. And with these lens, there was usually a thin granularity covering the optical surfaces, as you can see here, confirmation with a listening red staining. And here you see the confirmation again, showing calcium and phosphorus in the composition of the deposits. So uh, there are different studies done with the hydro view, and it was very interesting because it showed that the hydro view by Bausch and Lomb started to calcify after it was placed in the sure fold packaging. That packaging had elements uh, of uh, some components made actually of silicon. And it is well known that those components can contaminate the surface of the intraocular lens. And when you have the element silicon on the surface of intraocular lenses, this may represent sites for initiation of calcification. And this lens was not calcifying before the packaging was changed. 
So because of that study, we decided to do studies on the other lenses that were involved in large scale problems of calcification, such as the memory lens, the SC60BOV and the AquaSense. And again, we could demonstrate that the concentration of the element silicon was always higher in relation to the calcified deposits. So there was also some kind of problem with the packaging of those lenses. But what you have to know is that calcification is a very difficult problem to study. It is a multifactorial problem. There are studies showing that the packaging with silicon compounds is involved. Also, it seems that you have more calcification if you use in surgery OVDs that have a phosphate buffer. And there are also problems with local conditions of calcium and phosphate supersaturation around the IOLs. For example, if you leave behind cortical material and issues with a chronic breakdown of the blood aqueous barrier. It seems to be more frequent with diabetic patients, for example. And also other complications for the study of uh, calcification is the fact that many different manufacturers may buy the material from the same source. Actually, the material is the same, but then each one of them will have a different procedure for manufacturing. And then those lenses are going to be sent to different countries and market in different countries with different names. So this really complicate the evaluation of this problem. But what is really important for you is to know how to make the diagnosis of calcification. Because for example, in this study, we described eight cases where the diagnosis were, was not made for memory lens calcification. And those eyes underwent procedures that were totally not necessary. For example, uh, capsulotomy, posterior capsulotomy, because the ophthalmologist thought it was PCO. This may make explantation, which is in any way necessary, much more challenging. In some cases, uh, the eyes underwent vitrectomy to me because the ophthalmology thought it was some vitreous involvement. So uh, this is the most important cause of opacification that requires explantation. So explantation is in any way necessary, and this led to complications such as endophthalmitis, CME, even retinal detachment. So with a good slit lamp examination, you should be able to identify the deposits, and even if they are, they are on the surface, subsurface, or within the lenses. And the latest large scale problem is related to a company named um, Oculentis. This is a company in Germany and we analyze a huge number of lenses that were explanted in Europe. They were manufactured with all kinds of designs. And what is very interesting here is that these are all hydrophilic acrylic lenses with a hydrophobic coating, which has been described by some people as able to prevent calcification. But as you can see, this is really not the case. But these lenses were not available in the United States. So what we see uh, coming from the United States, it's really what's described here. This is a localized form of uh, opacification, of calcification of hydrophilic acrylic lenses that, are, that is observed in a round region on the anterior surface and subsurface of the lens, as you can see here, usually in the area of the capsular axis opening or the pupillary area. And initially we described these in association with procedures using tracheal injection of air or gas, such as the MAC or the SEC. And here you can see different examples. These are all different lenses, hydrophilic acrylic lenses available in the US. And you see the pattern is always the same, a very limited area here of very dense calcification, usually the opening of the capsular axis. And this is not related to any particular hydrophilic acrylic lens uh, design or manufacturer. So you really can see these even in lenses that usually were not described as calcifying. So after that publication, we published these two new cases. And this one here is interesting because the Sulcoflex is a lens that's very popular in other countries because it was specifically designed uh, as a supplementary IOL to be used in pigback procedures. And this is a lens that's very appreciated, never calcified, but then after the MAC, 
we had different cases of this localized form of calcification. And this is a Zeiss lens that also never calcified. This is a lens that also has a hydrophobic coating, although it is a hydrophilic acrylic lens. And some people thought, okay, this coating is going to prevent calcification, but it really does not. So you can see the localized form here, and this was after the MAC. But we thought initially this is all related to intracameral injections of air or gas, and you have this air in contact with the anterior surface of the lens. But then we started to receive a lot of hydrophilic acrylic lenses with exactly the same pattern of calcification occurring after procedures in the posterior segment. And you have some examples here after retinal surgery. So again, so localized to the pupillary opening or the capsular axis opening. So this is the area of the lens that's in direct contact with the aqueous humor. And you have some other examples here. And also we had some cases just occurring after intravitreal injections, no, no surgical procedures. So this case here is very interesting and I want to highlight because the patient had a single piece hydrophobic acrylic lens in the sulcus and then of course he had problems related to uveitis, glaucoma, hyphema syndrome and Dr. Fram used the, the small incision for point sclerofixation of the acrylic IOL and this is a technique that has been very very popular for this type of fixation but then the patient needs a retinal surgery and the IOL calcifies uh, a few months after the procedure and explantation was necessary. So basically, initially, as I mentioned, we thought this was a problem related to the contact between the anterior surface of the lens with gas or air or even silicon oil. But we do not believe it's just that now. We believe there is a real metabolic change in the anterior chamber, in the aqueous humor, maybe due to the presence of all of these exogenous substances, but also because of some form of sub clinical inflammatory reaction that's going on in these eyes. And these are all eyes that are undergoing repeated procedures or repeated injections. So what we recommend, at least for the moment, is that if you have a patient uh, for cataract surgery and you know, based on corneal examination, that this patient is going to require procedures such as the MAC or the SAC, you should avoid uh, implanting hydrophilic acrylic lenses in these patients because some studies show that this problem may occur up to in 10% of the cases, which is quite high. I wanted to comment a little bit about interaction of hydrophilic acrylic lenses with capsular dyes because this is very interesting and I'm going to use this case as an example. But this really happened with a very special intraocular lens. So basically in this case, this was a white cataract and the surgeon used um, tripan blue dye, you know, to stain the anterior capsule and enhance visualization for performance of the capsular rexes. But then a few days later, uh, the patient was seeing dark blue halos everywhere. So the lens was explanted. And this lens has a water content that's very high, 73.5%. The standard hydrophilic acrylic lenses are usually within 25, 26%. So this lens is actually inserted in the dry state when it is very small. It goes through a small incision. And once in the capsular bag, it hydrates very fast and expands. However, as you can imagine, this lens acts as a sponge and is able to absorb any residual amount of capsular dye inside of the capsular bag, so you cannot use this lens with capsular dyes. Based on that study, different groups is starting, is started to evaluate the interaction between capsular dyes and intraocular lenses, and they found that there is usually minimal or no uptake of dye with PMMA, hydrophobic acrylic, and silicon lenses, but there is interaction with hydrophilic acrylic lenses. However, the majority of those lenses are already implanted in the hydrated state, therefore you do not hear about this type of problem. Let us move on with problems related to silicon lenses. We are going to talk about surface deposition, opacification by influx of water, and also problems with the loop elements. 
And uh, silicon lenses may also calcify, but we only observe these in eyes with asteroid hyaluses. We first described that with plate silicon lenses. These are old type of lenses with old silicon materials. And the deposits were always on the posterior surface of the lens, but they are different. They are very superficial. So you actually can use a YAG laser to clean the surface of the lens. However, you have reaccumulation of the deposits after that, especially if the posterior capsule is open, because then you have contact between the vitreous and the IOL. So as you know, uh, the composition of the asteroid bo bodies is calcium, phosphorus, and does represent continuous supply of calcium or are an indicator of a continuous supply of calcium to the vitreous. So you have here node uh, silicon lens that was explanted, and you see the plaque of calcification here that actually was cleared up to some extent by YAG laser. You have all the YAG pits here and confirmation of calcium and phosphorus within the deposits. This case is interesting because the patient actually had bilateral asteroid hyalosis and the other eye of the patient was implanted with a hydrophobic acrylic lens that never calcified, whereas the silicon lens did calcify and was explanted. And here is the latest study we did involving 16 cases. And this is interesting because even modern silicon lenses are included here. Those lenses made of materials with higher refractive index, square edges. And you can see here that it doesn't matter what type of silicon lens, the aspect is always the same. Posterior surface of the optic with the deposits, it can be cleared with YAG laser, but you have the reaccumulation after that. And here you have eight IOL designs from five manufacturers using five silicone materials that are all different. And this is not restricted to any kind of silicone lenses. This may occur with any silicone lens. And again, the same aspect. Sometimes the plaque has a very strange morphological appearance, but then you confirm the presence of calcium and phosphate, uh, phosphorus within that. And um, here, I highlighted here that in these last 16 cases, we confirmed the presence of asteroid hyalosis in almost all of them. And sometimes you have to ask the ophthalmologist to really take a look because the degree of asteroid hyalosis can be quite minimum. But we reviewed um, cases of calcification of hydrophilic acrylic lenses, more than 100 of them, and we could not find any correlation with asteroid hyalosis. Therefore, this phenomenon appears to be restricted to the silicone lenses. So we do recommend that you do not implant silicone lenses in eyes with asteroid hyalosis. This is a great time for me to remind you that if you have a patient with retinal problems or even potential for retinal problems, one day this patient may need uh, surgery with silicone oil, you should not implant silicone lenses in this patient because silicone oil may attach to the surface of the silicone lenses and you may have to explant the lenses. This is also the type of lenses that are going to fog during retina surgery, so really not ideal for this type of patients. This case is here very interesting because we had an outbreak of toxic anterior segment syndrome after implantation of 3P silicone lenses via clear corneal incisions, uneventful surgery. So this task, this is a um, um, condition where you have an exaggerated inflammatory reaction very fast after surgery, and the signs and symptoms are usually restricted to the anterior segment. That's why it's called toxic anterior segment syndrome. Many things can cause that. And here after surgery, the surgeon was placing ointment on the eye of the patient and applying a very tight eye patch. So there was this oily substance floating in the anterior chamber that later coated the endothelium, but also coated the surfaces of the silicone lenses that were implanted. You can see there was corneal edema, raised intraocular pressure, huge inflammatory reaction. And by the additional procedures necessary in, this, necessary in these cases, you can see that this was really very serious, including 
uh, corneal grafts in the IOLs had to be explanted. And we had to do a lot of analysis to understand what was going on. And the most important analysis were gas chromatography mass spectrometry of the substance that was coating the intraocular lens. We compared these to all solutions used before during and after surgery. And then we figure out that this was related to the ointment that was applied after surgery. So you have to be very careful with the combination, clear corneal incisions, ointment, and eye patches because ointment is very, very toxic to intraocular tissues. These cases here are also very interesting because these three P silicon lenses were implanted after uneventful phaco emulsification, but as early as seven hours after surgery, they were completely opacified. And uh, these lenses all came from Brazil from different places, and they were sent to me in, immersed in some solution. And as I was analyzing them and they were drying out, the opacification was disappearing. And I would put the lenses back in solution and they you become completely opacified again. This is how you see the opacification under light microscopy. It gets this brownish discoloration and you see that this disappears with time. So again, that was a very interesting problem and we had to do all kinds of analysis and gas chromatography mass spectrometry again was very important because it demonstrated that the lenses absorbed exogenous molecules such as terpenes and ketones, but those are not used in the manufacturing procedure. Those are typically found in industrial cleaning agents and fumigants. So we were very confused about these results, but with the help of the manufacturer and the serial number of the lenses, we could trace back the history of each one of the lenses. And actually, they were implanted and explanted in different places in Brazil, but they had been before that stored in one single location where fumigation was performed for insects. So we cannot forget that uh, these lenses may be packaged in semi-permeable packages to allow sterilization by gas. So other chemicals in vapor um, can penetrate this package, contaminate the intraocular lens and cause surface changes, including, for example, increasing water influx in a lens that's normally very hydrophobic. So you have to be very careful with the conditions of intraocular lens storage. And to finalize the silicon uh, part, I wanted to just comment about these interesting cases with these three P silicon lens with polyimide haptics. And this material is considered safe to use in implantable devices, is not cytotoxic, but there are just few studies that check the long-term biocompatibility. And here we had two cases where the after more than 12 years of implantation, the patients came for regular, um, you know, just routine ophthalmologic, uh, ophthalmological examination. They received drops for pupil dilation. And in the room, I mean, the haptics broke and the IOLs dislocated. It was really very strange. So these lenses were sent to me. And as I was checking them under the microscope, just by touching the haptics with the forceps, I mean, the haptics were totally brittle. And we did scan the electron microscopy, and there was not really, there were no, no signs of really uh, evident degradation here. What you see here are salts. So basically what happened is that in the long term, uh, that material completely lost its elasticity. And I'm not aware of other cases. So after this publication, we didn't hear about this problem anymore. So it is possible that this problem was restricted to some lots of these lenses. So there is a condition that may opacify PMMA lenses, and we named this snowflake degeneration. And this happens with three-piece PMMA lenses with proline or PMMA haptics manufactured usually by injection molding in the 80s and early 90s. We initially described 25 cases. Everything happens very slowly, gradual symptoms, and it may take more than 10 years for this to be clinically significant. This was classified in four different clinical and pathological grades, but here is what you see as grade four. 
when you get to this point, the IOL usually has to be explanted. And you see the lesions are more in the central area and the periphery does not really show evidences of these lesions because it's usually protected by the iris. So uh, the major theory here is that those lenses were manufactured with an excess molecule to polymerize the MMA into PMMA. And with the long-term uh, UV exposure, there was liberation of gas inside of the lens. And when you look at these lesions in high magnification, it's like small micro explosions inside of the optic. So these are dry lesions. We have to differentiate them from the glistenings. We are going to talk about them later, but the clinical significance may depend on the amount of water that's collected here. You can see the opacification is very important in the hydrated state. And here is a high magnification photograph of the lesion. We have not been seeing these in more modern PMMA lenses manufactured usually via other procedures. And actually it is becoming rare to get such lenses explanted because of this problem, because as I mentioned, these are old lenses. So in terms of hydrophobic acrylic lenses, we are going to talk about these three problems, interlenticular opacification, glistenings, and subsurface nanoglistenings. So uh, the material that causes PCO is the same material that causes opacification between two lenses inside of the bag. All the cases we had were hydro, uh, hydrophobic acrylic lenses, Acrosoft lenses in the bag implanted via relatively small capsule rexes. The Acrosoft material has some adhesive properties. So again, these are the cells that instead of growing here are going to grow in between the lenses. So you still can put both lenses in the bag, but you can do a large capsule rexis and hopefully the anterior capsule is going to attach to the posterior capsule and the equatorial region of the bag is going to be sequestered. Or what is more popular, you put one lens in the bag via smaller rexis and one in the sulcus. And you can see here that in this scenario, the equatorial region is also sequestered. But I have to remind you that not all intraocular lenses are good to be placed in the sulcus because, for example, we publish on this case with this three-piece hydrophobic acrylic lens, which has very thick, very thick optic edges, and you see side walls they are not polished and rough edges, and this causes all kinds of problems, including pigmentary glaucoma. Again, a good time for me to remind you that single piece lenses with very thick haptics, side walls, they are not polished, square edges, they are really not good for the sulcus. And we initially published on these cases where the presence of these haptics in the sulcus caused all kinds of problems related to uveitis, glaucoma, hyphema syndrome. Here you see a lot of pigmentary dispersion on the lenses and you can see how rough the edges can be. So let us discuss a little bit about glistenings which are fluid-filled microvacuoles that you are going to see within the IOL optic when it is in the aqueous environment. They usually are up to 20 microns. They are observed throughout the optic. And they are usually described with the hydrophobic acrylic lenses, especially the Acrosoft type. But actually, they can be observed with other lenses, other materials, as you can see here. But basically, they are related to hydrophobic acrylic lenses. So any polymer uh, has very different components in the material, and you may have microvoids within the polymer network. And you put this polymer in water, this is going to absorb water, especially with raised temperatures. So the water that's absorbed is usually not visible, is in, for, in the shape of water vapor. But if you put the lens in a warm water, then you lower the temperature, that water inside of the polymer is going to become oversaturated, is going to detach and gather inside of the microvoids. And because of the differences in refractive index between the water and the material, the light is going to be refracted and is scattered at the water polymer interfaces. So some studies show that this glistening like vac vacuum formation can be initiated by a three degree Celsius temperature decrease from body temperature. 
If you go to the literature, some studies are going to say that this is clinically significant. Other studies are going to say that this is not clinical significant clinically significant. Very rarely in our laboratory, we receive lenses explanted because of glistenings. So there was, uh, for the Acrosoft lens, a production process optimization to decrease the formation, uh, the formation of phase separation. And this improved and decreased glistenings and subsurface nanoglistenings formation. It did not solve the problem, but it definitely improved. And again, I mentioned that now we have the glistenings-free hydrophobic acrylic materials. And I had the opportunity to evaluate all of these lenses in the lab. You put them in solution, you change the temperature, and indeed, these lenses here fit the description of glistenings-free lenses. So in terms of subsurface nanoglycinins, this is interesting because many people do not know about them. Here you have two Acrosoft lenses in the water. The light is coming from above. And now I put the light is coming from both sides and this lens is completely looking like opacified. This is a lens that was explanted from a cadaver eye. Basically, these are water molecules accumulating here in the subsurface region of the optic Different from glistenings, which are the microvacuoles within the substance of the lenses, much larger. And you can analyze subsurface nanoglycinins with shine fluke photography and densitometry analysis. You are going to measure the back light scattering. So you can see here how it looks with this lens. And with this lens here, you do not see any outline of the optic. And we perform different studies showing that, yes, the backlight scattering is really increased with the subsurface lenoglycinins, but this is not related to a change in the light transmission to those lenses. So we also have to evaluate the forward light scattering because this is the light that's going to go uh, be transmitted to the retina and may cause some problems. So I collaborated with this group and their in vitro model and we use the explanted lenses. And indeed with the subsurface nanoglycinins, you can see a little bit of increase here, but this is not expected to be clinically significant. But if you analyze a, a lens that's calcified or a lens that has a snowflake degeneration, then this is definitely uh, really increased and expected to be clinically significant. Can uh, hydrophobic acrylic lenses calcify? So uh, in this case, I'm going to use this case to illustrate this problem. So this patient actually had silicone lenses implanted in both eyes. Everything was fine. And some years later, there was decrease in the visual acuity. And the ophthalmologist described cloudiness of the silicone lenses. They were explanted, but we never analyzed them. And there was an exchange to hydrophobic acrylic lenses. Everything was fine, but later again, decreasing visual acuity and other complaints. And again, the ophthalmologist, okay, those lenses look cloudy also. So finally, he sent to me these images from the left eye. And I thought, maybe for the first time, I am seeing calcification of a hydrophobic acrylic lens. So this was explanted. And when I put under the light microscope, I already, already changed my mind because this really didn't look like calcification. The deposits were very different from what we normally see in calcification. We did scanning electromicroscopy surface analysis and could completely rule out calcification and staining with proteins was positive. So for some reason, this patient always have, has this weird uh, protein, protein reaction after implantation. This is important because in this paper here, this is a review of pseudofake patients undergoing the MAC. They described 14 patients had calcification and two had hydrophobic acrylic lenses. I emailed them, I asked to see those lenses and they said, oh no, this did not need to be explanted, which tells me it's not calcification. This is likely subsurface nanoglycinins. So same thing here with this paper, they reviewed all of these cases of the SEC, described almost 10% of calcification and that one of the lenses was hydrophobic acrylic. Uh, hydrophobic acrylic. And again, I asked them, can I see the lens and analyze the lens for you? Oh no, it didn't need to be explanted. So this is not calcification. 
So I am not aware of any case of calcification of a hydrophobic acrylic lens with laboratory analysis. So I wanted just to comment on this. This is the Invista that was launched as this model in 2012 and then relaunched in 2018 with changes to the uh, properties of the material to facilitate unfolding. And I was contacted by many surgeons. Okay, I'm seeing these lenses. They are all opacified, but it was not clinically significant. But some of them end up being explanted. And what I found is just a surface rugosity, manufacturing marks. So it seems that when the company changed the material, they did not change the polishing procedure to be adapted to the new material. And after they did that, they corrected the problem. But it seems that it was just a cosmetic problem. And here we just published this case is a Technis multifocal lens. The patient had glare for uh, many years, but the IOL is decentered. However, uh, the, the communication with the ophthalmologist was the description of this opacity he was seeing. And indeed, we could reproduce this in the lab. And we analyzed this lens in all kinds of ways, could not really find anything other than small light transmittance and contracts changes, unlikely to be clinically significant. So this lens was explained because it was decentered. And there are other papers describing this. This is something you can see with this lens, but it does not mean it's clinically significant. So nobody needs to rush for explantation. So, I mean, there are different causes that are related to different things. The patient, the IOL storage manufacturer, among any uh, uh, different factors that may lead to opacification of the lens very fast after surgery, but also many years after surgery. But it is also an influence of IOL material design. For example, surgical techniques, site of implantation. If you have a lens that's not adapted for the sulcus, this lens is going to cause a lot of problems in that location. So with increasing number of new lenses in the market, you have to, to have a constant vigilance. So just a small comment to finalize on in the bag IOL dislocated cases. And we have been seeing an increasing number of IOLs explanted within the bag. Every year we have more and more. And as you know, one of the most important causes of zonal weakening and in the bag dislocation is pseudoexfoliation. We do not believe this is in association with any particular lens, material, or design. When you have a CTR in place, it's very interesting. This dislocates even faster, perhaps because there is a selection bias. You already put a CTR in the worst cases, but you can cause additional stress to the zoners when you insert a CTR. And here I wanted to illustrate that because even the presence of this CTR in this capsular bag did not prevent fibrosis, capsulorexis, phimosis, and the IOL is actually flexed anteriorly, and this is transmitted to the zoners, and of course it dislocates. This paper is interesting because we had 40 in the bag dislocated IOLs. We performed histopathological examination in all of them and found in 26 cases, evidences of pseudoexfoliation, but in only 13 of them, there was a diagnosis of pseudoexfoliation. So this is a condition that can go um, without being uh, recognized. And you probably heard about the dead bag syndrome. So these are very interesting cases where the common feature is that the capsular bag is very clear many years after surgery without fibrotic changes or proliferative material without, within it. And Dr. Masket coined the term dead bag syndrome. You can see some of the photos here. And we published the first paper last year in the JCRS, including 10 cases. And we had eight IOLs to check and seven capsular bags. You can see here how clear the capsular bag can be. And we provided complete histopathological evaluation of the capsular bags and five IOLs. And compare this, those findings with that series from Germany with pseudoexfoliation and without pseudoexfoliation. And here you have beautiful surgery from Dr. Jason Jones showing one case. He's rotating the lens out for explantation, bisecting the lens. And you're going to see how clear the capsular bag is. He's, he just goes and removes the entire capsular bag because he said the capsular bag was also splitting spontaneously 
during surgery. So as you can see here. So there was nothing really special about the IOLs in this case, in these cases. So we do not believe this is related to any material or any design. Look how clear this is, no fibrotic changes, no summaries rank. However, the capsular bag itself was showing many areas of splitting or delamination. And as you can imagine, if this occurs at the zonal attachments, this is going to lead to dislocation. And there was almost no lens epithelial cell or very rare lens epithelial cells in these specimens. So in this summary here, you see that when you have in the bag dislocation with or without pseudo exfoliation, you have a lot of summary ring and lens epithelial cells. We found just one specimen with delamination. So you can see this delamination also in true exfoliation syndrome, but usually this is related to patients working with intense heat. This can be seen also in, in advancing, uh, advanced aging. The lens epithelial cells are very important for the capsule and uh, they continue to deposit material on the capsule throughout life. Some surgeons read our paper and they're asking, okay, I'm polishing so much now. Am I causing dead bag syndrome cases because of my polishing? We do not believe that because you cannot polish up to the extent to remove every lens epithelial cell. You usually do not polish at the equatorial region of the capsular bag. So we do not believe is that. Another possibility is that the problem is starts in the capsule and then causes damage to the lens epithelial cells, loss of cells with further damage to the capsule because the capsule is also very important for the cells, is the anchoring point. So there is still a lot of unknowns in the etiology manifestations of dead bag syndrome. We do believe there is a spectrum and what we described so far is the far end of the spectrum. And um, we still have to understand better this relationship between lens epithelial cells and capsular bag strength and integrity. And to finalize, just a comment about this study I just presented at the ASCRS a few days ago. We are now collaborating with a Japanese group doing immunohistochemistry of capsular bags and dead bag syndrome. And what has been very interesting is that they found collagen type 1 and fibronectin in these capsules. So these are components that are usually secreted by the lens epithelial cells after surgery as part of the healing process. They found that in areas without cells, which suggests that the cells were there, spent some time there, secreted those components, but then something happened, there was damage, they died and they detached from the capsule. So this is another evidence that's not a due polishing to match. I mean, we still do not know what is causing the damage to the lens epithelial cells, but this is being recognized. I mean, we hear more and more about these cases. So at this point, I would like to thank you all very much for your attention and thank you all very much for this invitation. Again, it's such an honor to be here and to deliver this lecture and to visit your center. Thank you. And if you have any question, I'll try to help. Susanna? <laughs> Very, very interesting, and and also, uh, I mean, very scary that there's all these uh, things happening in in uh, standard materials. So I guess my question is, uh, like moving forward in developing new materials, and I mean, we know the of these uh, um, novel intraocular lenses that are coming up that you know may release drugs or you know they're they're combined with other things that make uh, potentially the material more. Uh, sophisticated and challenging. What are your recommendations uh, to the biomaterial scientists that would be uh, looking into designing new materials for your documents? And it is a great question because, of course, you want a material that's very clean. As an ophthalmologist, you want to sit at this lit lamp and see a lens that's beautiful, that is clean, that doesn't have glisten, it's calcification, anything. But when you talk about the new lenses in the horizon, there are also all those new ideas about accommodating lenses. Those lenses require certain properties. So we have to take into account the biomechanical properties too, because some materials may be more flexible than others and everything. So you have to take into account the entire thing. 
but in terms of avoiding um, all these glistenings and oh yeah, and I other. mean nowadays you have uh, I would say the hydrophobic acrylic materials are likely the most popular nowadays, and you have choice among different hydrophobic acrylic materials that do not have glistenings as an issue. So you have you have great choices, and single piece lenses are of course uh, one of the preferred nowadays. Also, if you consider in terms of popularity, but you have to know that they are not so good for the so-called also so you have to take all of those things in consideration and, and in terms of hydrophilic acrylic lenses i mean this is always a question that i get should they be abandoned and it is difficult to answer that because in our laboratory we see these complications every day in large numbers but then when you try to really get the rate of these complications they are not so high, it's like 1%, less than 1%. But of course, we see this all the time. But on the other hand, it's 1%, but it will require explantation. So if you have a patient with an eye that's already complicated, and now you have to do an explantation procedure, 1% is even too much. But so people say maybe we should all abandon hydrophilic acrylic lenses, but they are also quite biocompatible. The eye is very beautiful after implant that, no inflammatory reaction. They are very flexible. They can be used for the other applications we mentioned. So yeah, it's a balance. Yeah, and my second question is on the colomer material. So you listed the colomer material. Oh, yeah. uh, this is a co-polymer with, uh, with collagen used in, in ICLs. Um, any, any it is a very of... interesting material because it's thirty four percent water. It's hydrophilic acrylic material with collagen. I never saw a col colomer lens calcifying. Mm -hmm. So, to the best of my knowledge, there is no calcification with that lens. Because it's in claim... yeah, one, it's one in the, the claims... ICL and also in the um, in, like sort of fake lenses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's one of the claims of this material is that is uh, the collagen, which is only a small proportion of it, makes it more compatible so i was wondering whether you know like these materials that are the, that are you know proteins from from natural sources yeah. uh, we're working for example on silk uh fibrin biopolymers uh, -huh. uh whether they would be more prompt or less to the type of yeah, and you see the publications i mean i know they claim that because there is collagen is going to be a better recognition by the body and everything but the other materials are quite biocompatible too so to make a real difference that is really significant is difficult so it's as biocompatible as other materials it's difficult to prove that's more biocompatible in terms of uv biocompatibility that's what you are talking about yeah Finally, Lily, I'd just like to thank you and recognize your lecture today with this plaque from the Flamma Institute. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.